Yep. I have just connected the SQL Server. And when we create a new database, the two files will get created. Those are, I have said it's a minimum, but we can still have a third, four, five files also. So the basically MDF file will hold the actual data of the database and the LDF file will record the ongoing information. When a user or when I run a query to update or to insert the data in the database, the first thing what happens is the new rows which I'm trying to insert the database, those new rows will be inserted in LDF file for the first time and once the transaction being completed successfully, the data from the LDF file will be moved to the MDF file. This is how the transaction happens on SQL Server. I repeat it again. When a user executes a query to insert some rows in a table, those new rows first they get inserted in the LDF file and once the transaction commits successfully, the data in the LDF file will be flushed or will be moved to MDF file. And again, the process of moving the data from LDF file on to the MDF file will be taken care by the SQL itself. We don't need to do any manual thing. SQL Server itself runs checkpoint. The keyword is a checkpoint. SQL Server itself runs checkpoints for every 60 seconds and that checkpoints what it does is it will try to check all the data in the LDF file and whatever the data that is committed that data will be flushed from LDF file onto the MDF file. So this is the usually that happens at backend. And let's assume the user's transaction or a user is inserting some 10 million rows in a table and as per my explanation those 10 million rows first gets inserted in the LDF file and then after MDF file and assume the user query has inserted around 10,000 rows and then after due to some issues the transaction got failed or the user query got failed then as the SQL Server behaves ACID properties. As the SQL Server has got ACID properties, what it does is when a transaction get fails, whatever the rows that were inserted till now will be rolled back. So in our case, the user is trying to insert, it, insert 10 million rows in a table, but after inserting a 10,000 rows, if the transaction fails, those 10,000 rows will be removed from the LDF file. This is how the SQL maintains the data consistency. And apart from these MDF and LDF, we do have another file which we call as .ndf. So the, fir the first we know about these two files .mdf and .ndf and apart, sorry, it's .ldf and apart from these two, we can have another file which is .ndf and what is the requirement and when do, go, when do we go for .ndf and this .ndf, the abbreviation is either you can call it as next data file or some of the people will call it as secondary data file. So what is the requirement? When do we go for .ndf? The case is, let's say 
you have created a database test and you hosted dot mdf file on m drive let's assume and then dot ldf file on l drive this is the initial set of what you have done with the test database now later on the data is getting continuously loaded onto this database and you you notice that the m drive is running out of space so as users are using this database to load more and more data at one point this drive is running out of space so at this point what we do is as the mdf file is running out of space on the drive what happens when a user comes and if he tries to insert new data the transaction will get failed it is because there is no more space so to to expand the mdf file the user transaction will get fail and at some point the database might go into recovery pending there are some chances so to avoid this once you get to know that my drive is running out of space the next thing you can add a new file to the database that is called the ndf file you can add the new ndf file and keep it on a different drive maybe n drive you may think that okay if my m drive is running out of space can't i get my storage team to add more space on the drive yes it is possible but i'm talking that in a way where you don't have any option to either expand the m drive or adding more storage to the m drive if that is not the possible case then the only thing you can do is add new ndf file on to a different drive where you have more space and from then onwards whatever the new data coming on to your database you can divert those new data or new tables on to the n drive data file and this is the one of the reason why we go for an ndf file the reason is to avoid space issues and the other reason is for better performance i hope you got the reason why we go for ndf file and one of the reason is a space but the other reason i am saying is the performance the simple example i give you if i share a notepad file so if i keep a notepad file on your c drive and i ask all the 10 people to browse that notepad file and we obviously see that the notepad file either it get locked or blocked even if it responds it would be very slow because all the 10 people are accessing the same file on same drive so instead of that i can copy that file on to a different drive and i can ask you to browse half of them on to c drive and half of them on to d drive so there you can get a better performance because you are distributing the load on the drives so the, in the same way instead of keeping all the tables data in one mdf file in one drive what we can do is we can distribute the tables across two files maybe 10 tables in mdf file and other 10 tables in dot ndf file and these two files are on different drives then people who are accessing a tables that resides on ndf file will get a better performance 
In the same way, the people who are accessing the tables that resides on MDF file will have a better performance because both the requests are going across the drives. So there will be a better I.O. So that is a, one of the reason why we go for NDF file. Any questions about the NDF file? A good question from Venkat. How to know that MDF file or the drive where we keep the MDF files? It's not only very specific to MDF files. We also need to check our LDF file drives as well. But ultimately, how do we know the drive is running out of space? It is with the help of alerts. It is with the help of alerts that are configured to trigger an email to the DBA team in case of low disk space. If you have got one or two servers to work on, then maybe probably uh, every day when you log on to the server, we check the space on the drives. But if you are managing some hundreds of the servers in your organization, then probably we need to have monitoring tools. That monitoring tool will alert you whenever the drive space less than 15% or less than 20%. So it depends upon the organization to organization. So in my organization, something like we have some hundreds of servers. So whenever the free space on the drive falls below 15%, the tool, the monitoring tool, which is a ADR Diagnostic Manager, it gonna send an email to the DBA team. So once we get an alert, then we jump onto the server and we check why the space was filling up. and we act accordingly. If there is a possibility of adding more space on the drive, we add it. Or else we try to look forward for creating the files. Yes, Venkat, we do set the percentage to get alert. If you want to have an alert, if the free space falls below 15%, then you can set it. We learn more when we talk about uh, the alerts and notifications. I, I will show you in a, in, in a second how to create the NDF file. So in order to create the NDF file as of now, you know that have a sample DB and this sample DB has got two data, sorry, two files. One is MDF and the other is LDF. This is the MDF and this is the LDF. So before I go and create the NDF file, let us try to make ourselves comfortable with the options listing out here. So the first is the, the first column is a logical names. What are, what are, the, what are the file names you are talking till now about those are physical files, .mdf files and .ldf files, those are physically present on the drives. But these are logical names that really required for the SQL to identify your database. So these are the logical names of the database files and then this is a file type. The rows data indicates that is either .mdf file or .ndf file where the data really host and the second is the log the file type log it is for ldf file and then the third column is about the file group as it sounds we can group set of files assume i have a very complex and large database where i got one mdf and one LDF that is mandatory and apart from this I have got 10 NDF files I have got 10 NDF files and in those 10 NDF files I am storing the data in such a way that 
all the student's information will be stored in one data file that is in one NDF file and all the employees information in second NDF file and all the uh, maybe orders information on the third NDF file so it's nothing but just I'm grouping I'm trying to make the similar I'm trying to keep the similar data in one file so to make that way we have to create a file group so in order to create a file group you you can see on left hand side we have a file groups you can just click on it and by default we'll be having only one file group and that is a primary file group where the MDF file resides on it so if you want to create a new NDF file on and use it on a different drive the first thing we need to create a file group so that we can we can ask the SQL server to move the table whenever you create a new one when you create a new table how do you define that the table should either go on to the MDF file or NDF file it can be done with the help of file groups so in order to create a new file group in this in this window you see an add button you can just click on add and just give the name for the NDF file there is a name for the file group so I just give it as a secondary and the second column is the files how many files you want to group in this file group so as of now I haven't created any new file so I leave it at zero and the next column is read only if you click this read only option then your file group will become read only and uh, I don't think you really need this option at this moment but in complex environments and situations we make it read only but I, I will I will explain this when we are in topic of backups and restores but now it's not required and the next and the last one is a default you can see now the primary file group is set as default what it indicates it indicates when I create a new table by default that table will be created in primary file group so when I say primary file group if you go back here the primary file group is this one that means it gets created on this MDF file but the situation is the drive is running out of space the drive where this MDF file exists is running out of space so I don't want to create any new tables on this MDF file so in that case as we have already created a secondary file group now in this place you see a add button just click on add and provide a new logical name what you want to call it so I say sample new file and then after all you can see the row types it automatically picks off row data saying that this is a data file it might be a master data file or a new data file but ultimately it is a data file and then after the file group you can you can click on the drop down and you can select the secondary file group by selecting the secondary file group what it indicates is we are matching the NDF file in secondary file group so when we create a new table we can define that okay this table should be created in secondary file group we can write a syntax while we create a table at bottom we can give on which file group this table should go so I will I will show you in a second so I'm mapping this new file in secondary file group and I would change can we give the same name for NDF file as an LDF file 
if it is a logical name no the name should be different so I would like to change the path because I don't want to keep the NDF file on C drive so I select it as a D drive Yes, obviously you can give it because somewhere you are distinguish with the extensions. You can have two files with the same name for NDF and NDF, but it doesn't really make sense. You need to uh, you need to understand by looking at the file names why what the file name it got. So I can still go for sample DB underscore NDF, but it doesn't make sense. If you look if you jump onto your server most of the times the extensions will not be shown the file extensions will be automatically hidden so in that case it makes you confuse whether this is a MDF file or NDF file until you look at the description of the column of that file so it is always good to make yourself life easy so that it's sample DB new then it's NDF so once you define this way you can just click on OK so now for this file we have got three files one MDF LDF and the third is the NDF so you can go and check the file on D drive now you can see a new NDF file has been created now how should I move the new table onto a NDF file one way is if you go to the properties of this database and then file groups we have an option called default when the primary set is default then when whenever a user creates a table I'm just writing a sample table script okay I'm creating a table which is TBL underscore test with one column that is ID with an integer value if I execute the script now it gonna create on my primary file group by default it is because primary file group is set for default so this table will be created in my primary file group but what if you want to get this newly created table into secondary instead of primary so there are two options one is either you can make your secondary file group as default or what you can do is at the end you can just provide the file group name at the end of the line for a table script you can clearly specify that this table should be created on the secondary file group you can execute this I just renamed this table so a new table is getting created on my secondary file group so under sample DB we now have two tables the first table resides on primary file group and the second table resides on secondary file group So any questions about the file groups? The advantages of having the file groups better we know or we feel it uh, when we actually discuss about the backups and restores. But for now it is required to overcome the space issues and to get a better performance. until now we came to 
a position that the data will be stored in MDF and LDF files. Okay. Now we go a bit in depth. Inside the MDF and LDF files, how the table data will be stored. Inside the MDF, LDF or NDF files, how the data will be stored. The answer is the data will be stored in the form of pages. So now I have created a new table. So some space in that MDF file will be allocated for this table. When I say some space, it's nothing but the page. So the data in the files will be stored in the form of pages. And each page will be of size 8 KB. I see a question. If we set default for primary also, does it take secondary if there is no space in primary? No. That's what I'm saying. Unless you specify on secondary. If you don't specify on secondary, whatever the file group is set as default, the tables will be created in that file group. And if you don't have free space on the drive, then your transaction will get failed. That's it. And I see a question from Naunita. Uh, Naunita, I request you to, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, ping it uh, openly so that uh, everyone can look at your question. I see uh, data automatically moves into NDF once MDF is full right No, SQL doesn't do that. SQL doesn't do in a way of moving the data automatically if one of the drive is full. It doesn't work that way. So the data inside the MDF file or NDF file will be stored in the form of pages. And we have created a new table. So it requires some space to store in the MDF file. So a page or two pages will be allocated this table. And when we start writing the data or when we start inserting the rows in this table, then at back end, the data will be written in the pages. When I say pages, it is almost same as our notebook pages. How we start writing on the notebook pages, the same way SQL will also start writing the data in the form of pages in your files and each page will be of size 8 KB. So whenever the page get filled off, that is whenever it reaches 8 KB, then SQL will provide a new page to the table. And each page at top will have a header information. And that header information will have the information something like for which table this page belongs to and what data this page contains. Let's say uh, I have created a student's table and have started inserting the data of the students IDs starting from 1 to 100. I'm inserting 100 student records in a student's table then when I start executing the query, the SQL at back end, it, it, it keep on writes the information on the pages and assume that the first page has accumulated around 20 records of that student page. Then after, it takes a new page from the SQL and it starts writing the data from the second page from row number 21. It keeps on right until your rows get finished off. And for each and every page, 
at this moment my table has used around four to five pages so the table got split into four to five pages and all these four to five pages at top will have a a space that is reserved for header and it keeps on it it makes a record that this page belongs to so and so table so there should be a mechanism right inside the uh, inside the data files or else we'll have uh, some hundreds of tables in the database and those hundreds of tables data will be written on to some thousands of pages so when we once the insert being done as a user when I try to read the data from the database how SQL Server knows that okay this table data is stored in so and so page number so to avoid all these things SQL Server on each and every page it stores the header information with which table this page belongs to so that when a user executes a query to pull out the data from a students then SQL Server will directly jump onto that specific page with the help of header information and each page is a limit of having a size of 8 KB and the collection of the collection of 8 pages is called as extent the collection of eight pages is called as extent which is of size would be 64 KB so each page is of size 8 KB and the collection of eight pages we call it as extent and the size would be 64 KB so whenever SQL release this space sorry whenever the OS release this page to the SQL internally SQL Server will get it as extent and it would be of 64 KB and that extent will have six pages in it and here we have got two types of extents one is uniformed extent and the other is mixed extent you can just map I can say in non-technical terms extent I can say is a small book with eight pages okay. so uniform extent is nothing but all the pages inside this extent we know that extent holds eight pages right so all these eight pages used by single table we call it as a uniform extent and what the mixed extent the eight pages in this extents are used by multiple tables let's say I have an extent with eight pages and have created a table with couple of rows then one I'm using one or two pages in that extent after that if uh, another user is trying to create another tiny table then the next set two pages will be used in the same way there's another user he's trying to create a one more tiny table and again it uses three or four pages so ultimately in single extent which contains eight pages is used by three different tables so then we call it as a mixed extent the mixed extent is nothing but the extent used by different objects uniform is ex uniform extent is the extent used by single object is it clear for everyone what a extent is and what a uniform extent and what a mixed extent yeah
okay uh, this is for a service pack upgrade which was pending in our last class so let me quickly take you through that once we install the base version it is recommended to apply the latest service packs on those SQL server so yesterday there we were we have to hold it because it was giving me an uh, error saying that you have to restart your machine so have the have done it uh, quickly before we started today's class so you can see the restart computer is also passed so we once once you can see everything is passed now you can go on to next and then you need to accept the license terms and you can see the list of instances for which you want to apply service packs let's assume uh, you have got four instances running on this machine you can still apply service pack to all four instances at one point as of now I have got only one instance running on this machine so it's giving only one instance if I had installed two or three instances then it would have listed out at the bottom and I can just select those two or three instances here and I can apply the service pack in one go and if you don't want to have maybe probably your requirement is apply the service pack only on one instance and don't apply on other instances then you can just uncheck the other two instances here and go further it's pretty much simple the service pack upgradation and this is the way we usually do on standalone servers but for in clustered servers the process would be different but uh, before we discuss more about these applying the service packs and cluster we need to know what a cluster mean so I will hold until we discuss a topic of clustering so this is a place where it checks the files in use it says the management studio is open and it need to be closed before this service pack being applied so it clearly says the ssms.exe process is not controlled by the update wizard you have to manually stop this process to avoid a computer restart it's not a showstopper for you you can still go with next but the only thing is you need to restart your machine once you apply service pack so I don't want to restart the machine again when we are in class so there's a question from Venkat is the latest service pack includes all the previous SPs yes if you remember I mean if you notice here on top it's SQL Server 2012 service pack 2 that is I am applying service pack 2 so what it holds is all the fixes and everything from the service pack 1 as well so you don't need to apply service pack 1 and then come then come on to service pack 2 it's not required you can you can always jump and apply the latest service pack if I had service pack 3 or 4 for this version then I would have applied the 4 or 3 which is the latest one so let me close the management studio before we go with the service pack you can exit it if you want you can save the queries or else you can just click on no now refresh the check and it still says the process is running it could be probably at back end the management studio application is up and running let me do yeah it's somewhere getting open I'm not sure how it got open so let me do a refresh again right so I don't have any other applications that is holding for this service pack so now I can go with the next and 
you directly came to a summary now you do if you if you just compare the things we haven't provided any of our input it's it's pretty straightforward for applying a service pack now you can just click on update and that's it your service pack update is in process and one more thing when we do a service packs it is always good to take the backups of all your databases don't bother about how to take a backup now we'll, we'll learn more about the backups and restore in our next class but as a rule remember that before you apply service packs not only service pack but what are the changes the major changes on your system before you do that it is always best to take a backups of your database it is because once you apply service pack most of the things will get changed all the binaries will be updated maybe there is a chance some applications which are working before might not work after applying the service pack or the users might not feel comfortable after applying the service pack there are some scenarios even you are good you are doing a good thing of applying the service pack as, as per the microsoft recommendations but there is still some possibility where the application doesn't like it so in that case we have to roll back we have to remove the update that we are installing now earlier days it would be very tough once you install the service pack there would be no option to roll back it but now we have we are a bit safe we can uninstall the service packs and the same way it's not a, a complex one the same way how we are installing it it's almost the same way we uninstall the service packs but the way is different we need to go to the uh, program programs and features to be in control panel and then you see programs So I hope everyone is aware of this one. If you want to uninstall any application or software from your machine, you just select the appropriate software and do uninstall. But for the updates or for the service packs, what whatever being applied on your softwares, you can do that using an option called View Installed Updates. On left hand side, you can see View Installed Updates. You can click on here and it will show you all the latest updates that were applied on your software. You can see here the Service Pack 2 is being applied. It's still going on. So if you don't like, if application doesn't like the Service Pack, you can always come here and do an un uninstallation. So it's not a big tricky as in our olden days. I got a question from Venkat. Can we install two different versions in one machine? Yes, it is possible, but in real time, people usually, usually doesn't go with that option. Maybe in our test servers or in our um, personal machines, yes, we can do. We can install SQL 2005, SQL 2008 R2, 2012, 2014, it is possible but in real time in production servers we stick with one version in one server hey guys th this is the picture how it looks like for the extent so this is a, a Sorry, this is a page. I hope you can see my screen. So this is the page. In each and every page inside the data file, the first will be the page header that will that where it reserves some space on the page. It it note down the table information, and if it has got any other links, it it write over there. And from then 
it will keep on writing data row row 1 row 2 row 3 and it it reserves some free space on that pages it is because whenever the data that comes into the table it try to push it at the bottom of this page I can give an example why the free space has been left reserved in each and every page let's say I'm creating students table with 10 records and assume this student table with 10 records were written into two pages and two pages were hundred percent used then after uh, other other users have created some 10 to 15 tables so the first page 1 page 2 were used by students and then after page 3 to page 20 used by other user tables and later I came back and have inserted two rows in my students table then those two rows will be written in page number 22 and 23 hope you are following me when I create the table for the first time the data will be stored in page 1 and page 2 and later other users were created some tables so the next pages were reserved and when I come back on the next day or sometime later and inserted couple of rows those two rows will be written on page number 22 and 23 so here my my table students was used different pages and they are located at different locations the data for the students were written into page 1 page 2 and then page 21 so whenever I try to read data from that table SQL has to read page 1 page 2 and then it has to scan and all the pages to find out where are the next rows so to avoid this thing we always try to keep some buffer space in each and every page so instead of filling out 100% on each and every page what we do is we'll fill out 80% and then we go on to next page so in that case possibly we, we can't restrict all the time but in this case when I insert a two new rows in the table at least as we have got a free space on page 1 and page 2 it somewhere accumulate the space in those two pages and the next is a mixed extent and uniform extent mixed extent is something that a single extent is used by different objects you can see here this extent has got table 2 table 3 and indexes and uniform extent is nothing but it is used by single table you can see all the pages in this extent being used by table 1 yeah and we are in the meantime we are done with the service pack upgrade here so just ensure everything being succeeded and you can close this and now you can go back and open the management studio and now you can notice the difference in the version number earlier it was 11.0.2660 somewhere and now after applying the service pack you can see the number being changed so in order to check the number we can check the web page which I have shown you yesterday SQL Server builds the first link so what the version number we are seeing now is 11.0.5058 so this is the number 11.0.5058 so it clearly says that it is SQL 2012 with SP2 earlier it was 11.0.2100 now it changed the version number so by looking at the version numbers we should be able to tell what the version it is and what the service packet got and we have also discussed the reasons why we choose for creating a new data file 
and we also saw how to create a new database. The one way of creating a new database is the scripting. Write a simple command saying select, sorry, create database database name. And the other way is using GUI. You can right click on the database and select new database. And you can just provide the database name here. I can say HDFC or HSBC. And here we are all a bit familiar with the logical name, file type and file group. And the next is the initial size. What is the initial size for your MDF file? It is 4 MB. When, when at the back end, the data files get created, right? The MDF and LDF files. So those data files will be created with the specifications. So if you want to create your M MDF file with size of 10 MB, you can alter it. And at back end, your MDF file will be created with the size of 10 MB. Initial size is 10 MB. But when users keep on inserting data in the database, the MDF file will grow gradually. But on what basis it has to grow? That what the auto growth settings will provide. It says by 1 MB and unlimited. That means whenever my MDF file reaches 10 MB, whenever it gets full, we are just reserving 10 MB for my MDF file. When actually user starts inserting data in this database, at some point the 10 MB will get filled off, then what the SQL Server has to do. So using these settings, it says when the 10 MB being used, increase the file size by 1 MB automatically and up to where it's unlimited. That means it's up to the drive space. It up to the free space on the drive. So you can change it if you feel that 1 MB is very tiny. If you are inserting some loads and loads of data in this database, then 1 MB doesn't make sense. So you can change it to either percent or you can change it to from 1 MB to 10 MB. And most of the time, we won't restrict any of the sizes. It says unlimited. That means your files can grow unlimited. If you restrict it, if you say, no, I want to limit my file maybe to 100, 100 MB, then once it reaches, once the MDF file reaches 100 MB, then your transactions will get failed. It doesn't allow any new records to come in. So it's not a good thing unless you really require for it. So we always keep it as unlimited because whatever the data that is coming in is a valid data and it is required for me to store in the database. And the next is the path where the MDF and LDF files were located and the last one is the file name about your MDF and LDF files. So you, you really not required to type the MDF and LDF files here. It automatically pick, pick up. So I just provided the HSBC database name and on left hand side, now guys, I would finish within a within couple of minutes now. I see a question. Do we get a request for increase of auto growth? No. Because users doesn't know whether the MDF or LDF file or NDF file is growing. They doesn't know about it. We need to make it unlimited so that whatever the data it is coming into the database, SQL automatically it expands its size to allow the new data. As an end user, or as an application user, they doesn't know whether your MDF file is filling out or not. So these are all the objectives and again, how these all objectives picked up. I just said create new database and have provided the HDFC HSBC name. I haven't provided any of these paths 
anything here I just provided the name and you can see automatically all these options true false true false and simple check some everything being selected here so do you remember how it got all this information I close and reopen it again Yeah, HSBC. So all these options, yes, Venkat, you are right. All these options were carried over from your model database. So now let me quickly show you here the how how the major I mean how it really uh, reflects. So I'm creating a new database which is called HSBC. So you can just click OK, the new database got created and in this new database, it's a fresh database so I don't have any tables in it. Okay. So now what, now what I do is, inside this model database, I create a sample table. So to create a sample, to create any table, again it can be done in two ways. One is G, using GUI, graphical user interface and the other way is writing T-SQL query. So let me show you using the GUI. You can right click on the table and do a new table. And here provide the column names. So I say ID, which is integer, and then name, the data type should be VACAR. So once you provide this information, you can right click here and say save table, provide the table name. I say it has, I call it as students. Then you can close it safely. Now you can refresh and find it out the new table inside your model database. Now as this is a template, now what I'm doing is I'm creating another new database on this instance and it say, and I call it as test DB and I just create it. So as per our definition, whatever the properties or whatever the model database contains, it will be taken as a template for the new coming databases. So now you can expand the test DB, then go to tables. Now you can see a student's table is already created, pre-created. I have just created a test DB. I haven't created any student's table inside this test DB. From, but from where it got picked up? It is from your model database. So in real time, maybe uh, the requirement is something like in, the, in an instance, all the databases should hold or should contain a common table. Maybe logging all the databases irrespective of what application it belongs to all the databases in that instance should have a table called logging so in that case as it is a predefined what you can do is you can create that logging table in model that's it all the new coming databases will hold that information or else if you won't create it in model then you have to make sure that you create that new table whenever a new database is created. So to make our life easy, we can create the table in model and leave it. SQL automatically takes whoever creates a new database on this table, sorry, on this server, the table automatically get created. and we have seen about the file groups and uh, the properties I will just finish off by explaining this one whatever the properties we are seeing here by right click on the database and going to properties the same thing can be done with a command called sp underscore help db using this sp underscore help db if you just execute this it will give you the basic properties of all the databases on that instance 
it gives the basic properties of all the databases on this instance. If you look at here, it nowhere giving information about the files, the MDF, LDF, where it hosts, it's not giving about that. But if you really want to have some in-depth information of individual database, then provide a parameter called sp underscore help db following with database name. Now you can execute it. It will give you in-depth details of that particular database. Now you can see here, this is a test db, the size, owner, then the logical name, file names, file groups, everything, whatever you have seen by right clicking on the database and going on to properties, the same thing will be listed over here. Everything will be shown. So you can use some basic commands, help db, sp underscore help db, following with database name will give you the properties of the database. Okay, I'm stopping here and we also discussed about the file groups and the use of the file groups. And uh, you can see here, if you don't specify anything while creating a file group, it will, cre it will get created in primary, which is a default. Question from Venkat, can I install SQL Server in other machine using, uh, yes you can do it if both the machines are in same domain and if you have LAN connected to each, yes you can do that. That's what in, in real time in organizations, we usually work remotely, we can sit on one server and we can browse the data from a different server. Okay guys, I would like to stop here. So any questions? Nitin Venkat Yeah. Okay guys, thank you very much. And one more thing, uh, I haven't checked with you. Have you installed SQL on your machine? Because you have, I mean, in order to practice all these things, creating a table and checking the files, you need the management studio with the SQL server. And please make sure that you do two installations. One, the default installation. And uh, once you're done with that, run the setup file again and the only change you have to give is the instead of default instance select named instance and give some name and you can proceed with installation so please make sure that you have installed two instances uh, Navnita my server agent is not installed it should not be the case if the installation is done then you would get uh, two things, database engine service and the agent service. And I can understand you, your issue. You might have, uh, you might have uh, used express edition. Instead of evaluation edition, you might have used express edition. In express edition, we only get database engine service and not the agent service. So could you please check what edition you are using? and try to download the edition which I have provided you, the Enterprise Evaluation Edition. Okay guys, thank you very much. I'm closing the call now. Have a good day.